Okay, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to an oral argument session of the 5th District Court of Appeal. It is 11 a.m., so we have case number 18-3337, Pilecki versus Federated National Insurance Company. Um, and if the appellant would like to just tell me how much time you'd like to reserve in a rebuttal before you get started, we'll try to do that for you. Okay, uh, five minutes if I may. Five minutes in rebuttal, okay. And uh, with that, counsel for the appellant, um, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Good morning and may it please the court. Matthew Struble on behalf of the appellant, Andrea Pilecki. And in this case, the trial court committed legal error prior to trial, during the trial, and subsequent to trial in the post-trial motion. And just one of those errors alone require reversal in this case. The legal error that occurred prior to trial occurred when the trial court sustained Federated Nationals objections to producing reports from its own adjuster and its own engineer claiming that they were work product. And those were objections were sustained even after Federated National disclosed those individuals as experts to be called at trial. The plaintiff, in this case, we attempted to obtain that information in five different ways. We filed a uh, request to produce a motion to overrule privilege objection. We requested interrogatories, but the court sustained every objection asserted by Federated National. And it was not until the end of trial that the court admitted that it had made error in those rulings. And then by the time the court finally made that recognition that it had made error, trial was already already almost completed and the trial was in the stage of Federated National putting on its case. And in this Council, case- So how many reports were you missing? So you can look at their, if you look at their privilege log, uh, which was um, contained and it's in the record on page 141, they identified it identified two reports from their engineer, which they claimed to be privileged. And they also identified a report from their field adjuster, which they claimed to be privileged. And those were uh, documents that, you know, clearly should have been produced, but never were. Um, and there's no way for Federated National in this case to show that that did not uh, contribute to the verdict in this case, because as an example, and we point this out in the reports, Throughout the case and throughout the trial, Federated National said things such as there is no evidence at all of there being mold. Federated, they claimed they were never advised or even put on notice of a claim for mold. They claimed that water came in through the uh, cracking of the exterior of the property. And lo and behold, their very own engineer report that they received before a lawsuit was even filed, never produced until trial was just about to be over, um, had their own engineer identifying apparent mold damage, advised him of that, and also um, identified the, uh, essentially ruled out uh, their, their position in the case, the interior water damage came from the exterior. So it's an undisputed legal error that occurred. And there well, no you, I think that one notable word you said was apparent mold damage, um, correct? Does that, does that matter? Isn't this issue sort of in some ways overlapping or intermingled with um, the directed verdict? That's the fact right. that there was, whether there was evidence, right, of mold? Well, they, they do come hand in hand a bit. So I would say that that doesn't matter for a number of reasons. One being that Federated National Defense in the case was that they were even, they tried to explain that they were never even put on notice or anywhere of any potential issue with mold uh, to then allow mold testing that was requested by Andrea Pilecki or removing the floors to access the mold, which she did, both of which are specifically covered under the insurance policy. And clearly if Federated had produced that um, information, we could have used it in opening statements, we could use it throughout the case, we could have provided it with our own experts to review as well. Uh, but that does go hand in hand with a, a, a second um, error that occurred during the trial in this case. And there were three primary errors that occurred during the trial. One of those is granting directed verdict on the mold claim. And in this case, even with the trial court improperly sustaining objections, excluding witnesses, the jury was still given testimony from Andrea Pilecki explaining that she observed mold, reported to Federated National, 
and removed her wood flooring to access what appeared to be the presence of mold, something specifically covered under the insurance policy. And, and but, how is that competent substantial evidence of the presence of mold given her uh, lack of training in regard to what actually is mold? Because if you look at the insurance policy, it provides coverage to do testing to determine whether you have mold or not. So you don't have to, so even if you don't have mold, you have the coverage to do it if there's a reasonable basis to believe you may have it. And that it clearly existed in this case from her testimony alone. It was also, even with all these objections through Federated Nationals test, testimony, they admitted on the stand uh, that their own adjuster advised of the likely presence of mold, that they uh, uh, included things such as microbial um, growth and applied that throughout the property. And we also had an expert estimator who did testify that he reviewed a mold report and based on that mold report, he prepared an estimate which included um, damages to uh, repair and do mold remediation at the property. Essentially, you know, which consists of uh, removing the wood floor, which Ms. Balecki did in this case. So look, you, all those evidence that we were still gave, able to get in, certainly um, a jury could have found that there was coverage, at least in some form, for the mold claim, which were, which were one of the primary- As to the, as to the mold claim, uh, it, it's, is it your position that that the evidence that you just listed um, uh, is competent substantial evidence that mold actually existed? I mean, do you th does the evidence need to establish that that there you know does it need to be substantial and competent that there was actually mold present? Um, it does not because, as I said, the policy provides coverage to test if you think there might be mold and determine whether there is mold or not. You can't do that with, without going forward and doing the mold testing. And that's the exact coverage that was requested from Federated National. So clearly, there was a reasonable basis to want to have that testing done, and there was substantial evidence of it. But, so, you're, but I mean, what did you, did you seek damages for uh, the appellee's failure to do the testing, or were you seeking damages for mold remediation? Uh, both. So it, our expert estimate included um, testing, and then he also included remediation as well. And then that goes into one of the, the second issues that occurred as to the so we were, we were as to the actual mold remediation that was uh, also set for, forth by a uh, witness from a company from Dry First, which did. Well, let's go back to the testing. What were your damages for failure to test? So I we'd, I'd have to look at James Purcell's uh, testimony. The, the issue became that he started to testify as to that and was going to be begin specifically delineating them. And then that's when the trial court starts sustaining objections and didn't let us um, offer that testimony. So, so I mean, in some ways, in some ways, uh, large portions of this argument you're making now seem to hinge on this other argument that you, you weren't allowed to present your an expert with expert testimony, correct? We were allowed to present several issues. So for example, our intent was- our, But I'm our, just trying to find out, you know, your claim for damages for failure to test, is that a standalone argument or do you have to, do you need to prevail on appeal on this other argument in order for that to come into play? Uh, I, I think they're all, they're independent of each other. So okay, so think, what were your damages for failure to test? So we, in terms of failure to test at trial, where we were precluded from specifically identifying it, if you look at the record, on page 406 of the trial. So it sounds like this argument is dependent upon the other arguments you're making on appeal, yes? If, if you're asking me, yeah, I, I believe at trial we established coverage for mold. If we were able to delineate a specific number to the jury, the, the court did not allow us to do that. Uh, we were prepared to, and, and our expert, James Purcell, explained he reviewed a mold protocol report, um, a mold remediation report. Uh, uh, he testified as to that at page 406 of the trial transcript. And then he included that in his estimate. And he's the, he's the president of Dry Right, is that correct? Um, so he's, he was our expert estimator from a company called ProScope. Got uh, the, the issue is confounded, though, as, as you're referring to Dry First. Now, this is a company that we intended to offer even more evidence from. Um, and this was a company that was at the property, has a mold license, did water mitigation, did a mold remediation uh, report and estimate. Uh, we called him. This one was Jerry Davis, correct? correct? Yeah, and the court did not. The court allowed him to testify as to water mitigation, uh, but when we tried to have him testify as to mold remediation based on his license and the estimate he actually uh, prepared himself, 
Defendant objected, said that they were surprised, and even on appeal, uh, their sole basis for trying to defend the trial court's decision is relying on the Binger case, where in the Binger, uh, that was a retained expert that was not disclosed at all in any manner. In this case, the witness that we call Jerry uh, Davis from Drive First was disclosed by the defendant themselves. That's that a fact was, witness, right? Correct. He was subpoenaed by um, defendant themselves to appear for trial, and they were in possession of his mold uh, estimate report that he prepared before a lawsuit was even filed. So they were prepared that he went out and actually went to the property and uh, prepared an estimate and was uh, did a mold remediation analysis. And Counsel, isn't there a difference between, you know, just sort of a lay witness who's going to testify regarding facts and an expert witness? Yeah, so I'm obviously a, a retained expert is somebody that we retain in litigation to give expert opinions and we pay them for their time. That is an expert witness. In this case, this was just a unbiased individual who had specific personal knowledge based on being a company that does remote remediation every day and went to the property and did motor remediation every day. Personal expert knowledge though, right? You were, you were offering the knowledge and the witness's expert capacity. You, uh, I don't think it would be expert because it's akin to a treating physician. It's just what you did on that specific patient. And same here, what he did at this specific property. And as a, one of the cases we cite to make it clear, even if it's a, a fact witness, they're allowed to speak to their specific um, experience and facts if it's based on sufficient knowledge. And obviously this is, he's a mold remediation company. He, if he was going to testify strictly as to factual matters, and not provide any expert opinions, how did that, how would that help you? How would that help your arguments on appeal? Yeah, because you testify that a factual issue, as you said, that we didn't get to establishing an amount. He was identifying an amount. I went in the property. Um, this is the estimate I prepared for mold remediation is $13,000. That is how you- No, 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 that, that's, that's damages for mold remediation. I was asking about what are the damages for failure to test? Yeah, so his was, again, we got stopped off before we can go into that. His estimate delineated it. But Did you make a proffer? Uh, yes, yes, we okay. went to get the, uh, the estimate and- um, where, where, is the, where is the proffer as to failure to test in the record? If, if I may, I, can I try to find that during my rebuttal time as I sit down? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I'll, I'll look for that. Then the third error was when the, the trial court admitted photographs, um, which the, even the defendant in their answer brief concede, concede, obviously, that has to come from a witness who can say that they fairly and accurately depict the property. In this case, they offered them through a, uh, the insurance company, offered photographs of a third party company, a completely separate company. And the witness that they offered them from had never even been to the property, had no idea what the property looked like, and clearly could not testify that they accurately depicted the property. With it clearly being error, the only issue is whether it could have influenced the jury. And the defendant's uh, response to that, I think, highlights our point. Because the only thing they say is that those photographs, those 11 photographs, were similar to the 300 other photographs. And the problem that they have and why that's clearly an issue here is that these 11 photographs admitted from somebody who never even stepped foot on the property were the only photographs that were taken after Hurricane Matthew. And Federated National admitted them through somebody who never even been on the property who could not possibly be cross-examined. The other 300 photographs that they actually admitted through witnesses were ones that were taken a year and a year and a half later. So the 11 photographs that they actually relied on that were actually relevant, they admitted through a witness who had never been to the property and obviously could not have confirmed that those photographs accurately depicted the property. That's clearly legal. Was error. there a contemporaneous... Was there a contemporaneous objection um, at the time that the foundation was being laid for the photographs? Yes, and there's a uh, multiple back and forth between us and the court at sidebar uh, discussing that issue and me objecting to it numerous times. And then uh, the final legal error. If we affirm the directed verdict on the mold claim, um, is, is this a still alive? Uh, is this argument you're making here still relevant? Yeah, absolutely. So just for, for example, as to the, the photographs, which they, the 11 photographs that they got in to try to argue that the interior damages were somehow excluded, those photographs are clearly relevant, relevant to that issue. 
in several issues, including the exterior damages that we claimed and interior water damages we claim, which is the bulk of the claim. Monetarily, the mold is a small amount, uh, but these issues as to, for example, the photographs are clearly relevant to the, heart, the big part of the claim, which is uh, water damage, which was that issue. Um, so it would still have to be reversed on that issue alone. And then finally, a reversible error occurred again after trial was completed when the court applied a set off. In this case, Federa uh, Andrea, Andrea Polecki is the uh, party that filed the lawsuit. Federated National forced uh, Darren Pilecki to be added to the lawsuit. Darren Pilecki was added to the lawsuit and then Federated National served a proposal for settlement for $30,000, which based on the terms of the proposal for settlement, number one, stated that the acceptance of it did not affect Andrea Pilecki's claim. It, it also, also stated though that it would be set off from any sums awarded to Andrea Pilecki. It's correct. It said that as well, which is obviously contrary to the specific statement, the acceptance of the proposal for settlement and cashing the check will not affect Andrea Pilecki's claim. And even more importantly, the proposal for settlement that they served to Darren Pilecki included repairs, which was the only thing the jury was awarding, but it also included costs. It also included interest, and it also included extra contractual damages. Interest, costs, extra contractual damages are damages that could only be addressed by the trial court after at the, the time, at the, uh, at the time um, it was accepted, was there only a one count complaint pending or was there a multi-count complaint pending? Uh, I believe it was one, I believe it was one uh, count for breach of contract. So, um, let me back up. So there, general rule in law is that there can only be one recovery of damages. In other words, you can't recover twice for the same damages. Correct. So, so how is that principle not implicated in this case? In other words, there, the damage is uh, the same when it comes to the husband and the wife. So how is it not double recovery if the trial court ignores those sums? Because the $15,000 awarded by the jury was solely for repairs. Extra contractual damages were, would be perfected and could be brought later. Interest and costs would be awarded by the trial court subsequent to the verdict, necessarily. A jury doesn't award those things. The jury award only included repairs. However, the trial court applied a set off for a settlement that by the very terms it did not just include repairs, it also included costs and interest. And you can't take a, a jury verdict that's only for repairs and uh, use it a, and compare it to a settlement offer that includes repairs and also includes interest and also includes cost and also includes extra contractual damages. How is there, let, let's take that as, you know, just as an assumption that there was additional, wouldn't some of the settlement have been for repairs? So, some portion of it, but a substantial amount would be for cost. That could the cost amount could certainly uh, be more than the jury verdict. If the, if the amount is applied to set off the judgment, though, that does leave Andrea Lucky the ability to, to recover the same cost, though, correct? Uh, no, because by, for, by, by the way the trial court did this, they set it off, and all the jur although the jury found Federated breached and owed another 15000 above the 25000 they had previously paid, by applying the set off, the trial court found that she recovered nothing at all and therefore had no entitlement. To well, but in, in theory, if, if the set off had been less than the amount awarded and would it would have been appropriate for additional costs. In other words, if the set off hadn't been inclusive of the costs, um, then that would have left Andrea Pilecki the opportunity. And in, in other words, just the fact that there was a settlement with her husband did not foreclose her ability to seek costs uh, from the insurance company. Right, but the but well, she never got the chance to because a, a, a mm -hmm. settlement that included cost was applied to the amount that she recovered. Certainly, they could have made the offer to to uh, Darren Plucky only include repairs. And, and similarly, with with a extra contractual damages, a settlement to her husband would not have precluded her ability to seek extra contractual damages if it would have been appropriate under the factual circumstances after set off. Right. Well, a, a bad faith claim. Extra contractual damages can only be claimed after the jury verdict is received. Uh, right. So, so, they, so it, the only reason that that 
your argument that uh, this settlement encompassed costs and extra contractual damages is really predicated on the amount of the award here, not necessarily the when the setoff was applied. Uh, no, the, the, that's predicated on Federated National specifically stating that the $30,000 included interest cost and extra contractual damages. They chose to include that within the settlement that they made with Darren Pilecki. And you can't take different damages and apply it to a set off to a jury verdict that solely includes repairs. I, I believe I'm not. It, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, counsel for the FLE, uh, you may begin whenever you're ready. May it please the court. Karen Bellis of Kibiki Draper for the FLE. FedNAT Insurance Company. I think the last argument made by opposing counsel sets the stage for what is really being complained of in this appeal. There is no reversible error, but what the plaintiff is actually unhappy with or displeased with here is that the jury believed his case, awarded damages, but didn't award enough damages for the plaintiff to obtain a judgment in her favor. And what the plaintiff has failed to do on appeal is not only show reversible error with any of these five or six legal issues, but has failed to argue that what the real issue is, that they're unhappy with an inadequate verdict, because that would not be enough to create reversible error. So they've tried to come up with five or six, as they said at, at trial, spaghetti style, throw it at the wall errors. Um, I think the first one, since, since, we, since the plaintiff spoke for some time about mold, I'd like to address the mold issue first. It's really a red herring. The plaintiff does no separate damages for mold testing. Mold wasn't in the complaint. Mold wasn't separately asked for for testing. It is, we have in our policy, a limited uh, coverage for mold, uh, for fungi and bacteria, and it does. It does include the cost for testing, but the policy is clear that the cost of testing, which is not a separate damage, the cost of testing is provided only to the extent that there is reason to believe that there is the presence of fungi, wet or dry rot or bacteria. It's the plaintiff's burden to prove that this damage occurred. And plaintiff put on no evidence at trial because there was no evidence. Um, Mrs. Pilecki's testimony alone is not enough. The fact that she observed mold or, or said she observed mold, this is clearly the case law, demonstrates that the issue of mold is one for expert testimony. So to begin with, her testimony alone. What about reason to believe, though? Well, is that, enough? Reason, is that enough for a reason to believe? It's not enough to get coverage. The fact that you say you think you might have mold is not enough to get coverage. And what's interesting about that is the plaintiff it's did. It's not enough to get testing? Not if. No, it is not because our expert went out within, I believe, nine days of the event, the hurricane, and found no evidence of mold. Then the plaintiff didn't make a claim at that point for mold, instead filed a lawsuit. In fact, after FedNAT very quickly failed, paid the first uh, payment of the full amount of the damages claimed at the time, which did not include mold. Uh, when ultimately the plaintiff did have someone called mold spec come to the property, someone who we were unable to depose, uh, who, who failed to appear. What's interesting is the mold spec report, which actually the defense put into evidence at trial, states that the mold spores, again, not mold, microbial, uh, uh, possible microbial spores was and the, 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 the mold related spores were within normal limits. So there's no question that it, if you look through the timeline, mold wasn't in the complaint. There was no complaint of mold initially. There was, when mold, someone was called out to look for mold, they found no mold. Uh, so there, it wasn't reasonable. 
and there was no evidence presented. And then when we get to the evidentiary issues regarding trial, plaintiff failed to list any expert witness for this topic that requires expert testimony. Well, there was no expert listed. There was no ev expert evidence attempted. Instead, Dry First, Dry First, who is a water mitigation company that was sent by, by FedNAT, not a mold remediation company, um, the, the records custodian for Dry First was listed as a witness, not even by name. I just think the records custodian. That turned out to be Jerry Davis. While on the stand, the plaintiff attempted to ask Mr. Davis about mold, attempted to proffer him as an expert Kelsey, witness. what about the discovery issues? Meaning, talk about that a little bit? Sure, I'm happy to. So again, this is a, I took a look at this last night and, and the timeline of this is interesting. And again, there's much ado about nothing. Plaintiff propounded discovery initially, Your Honor, with the complaint. Again, without making a, sub, uh, a subsequent claim after there was an initial payment, didn't come back to FedNet and say, you haven't paid me enough or there's something more. Instead, she filed a lawsuit with no mention of mold, as I said. With that complaint, she filed some initial discovery. At the time, which was May of 2017, when the defendant responded very early on in the litigation, there were no experts designated. So the plaintiff requested who were our experts initially and actually requested the reports as mentioned of any experts. There were no experts, number one. And number two, the field investigator's report was privileged as was the contractor who went to the house and engineer who went to the house as part of FedNAT's initial investigation. There were no expert listed, so there was no need to uh, respond to, to dis discovery. There's no requirement to supplement that discovery. What happens then is about a year, a year and a half later, FedNAT lists its expert witnesses, March 28th of 2018. On March 29th, the plaintiff sends an interrogatory to the defendant asking for expert witness reports and sends requests for production to non-parties to the three potential individuals, uh, the, the field adjuster, Mr. Cook, um, and our third witness, wanting non-party reports turned over. As argued at the hearing, in the, it's in the supplemental record, um, I believe at page 2498, Plaintiff did not pursue the correct discovery methods to get this information. Plaintiff asked for expert reports to be turned over. 1.280 of the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure is clear that you don't just get to turn over a report. Number one, we had privilege that had logs that hadn't been ruled on. And number two, the appropriate way is to send interrogatories ask for the substance of the testimony of the expert, then take the deposition of the expert. Here, the plaintiff actually set the depositions of the experts and then never took them. So this is much about, much to do about nothing. And then when we get to finally, again, no experts with the initial discovery, jump forward a year, a year and a half later, the experts are designated, they do the wrong method of seeking the discovery because we don't just turn over an expert report, they've got to depose them, but they've got to ask to interrogatory questions. They've got to move to compel better answers to the interrogatories that were sent, which the defendant did respond to and never complained about that. Instead, you get to trial and so first the judge's pretrial rulings were correct for all of those reasons, the procedural reasons. Then when we get to trial, and if I may add, pretrial, the plaintiff conceded they were no longer seeking financial discovery. They'd either gotten the one, the Bosher type discovery um, through the responses of the defendant 
And, and specifically on the page I just mentioned, they say, we're not seeking financial or business records. We have no interest in the financial or business records. This is 2498 of, this, of the um, supplemental record. Instead, they say, we want the claim file, which again would be privileged, which is why the trial court plus the improper discovery requests ruled the way she did prior to trial. Then at trial, the plaintiff actually says at page 544 of the trial, and again, some of, the, some of the reports that were requested did not exist. The only reports that existed were those of, of Cook. And at trial page 544, the plaintiff actually says, and, and the trial court never, never admitted any error, contrary to what, what my, the plaintiff's counsel has said here this morning. Instead, what happened was improper requests, but at trial, if that individual was going to testify, the judge decided they should have, the plaintiff should get the report if a report existed. And the plaintiff accepted that, never moved to strike any of these experts, never challenged the experts. Instead, at page Never moved for a continuance? Nope, no continuance, Your Honor. Instead, on page 544, we're willing to deal with it even if it, they hand it to us at the last minute, which is, again, all the procedural errors that had happened. The judge's rulings were correct. She never admitted to any uh, error because there wasn't any error in those rulings but then at trial made a decision, hey, if this guy has a report and he's gonna testify, they should have it. And he said, okay, we're willing to have it handed to us at the last minute. So, so that alleviate, obliviates all of the arguments about any error related to the report. Um, with regard to the photographs as laid out in our brief, this was not an independent third company that no one knew who they were. This was the field in investigator of the, uh, com of the insurance company. These came in through the corporate representative or Warren or FedNAT. And these came in as business records, the business exception to the hearsay rule. He established that they were taken by the investigator who went out within approximately a week as part of the, at the right time, that they were transmitted with his knowledge, that they were kept in the course of business. Uh, when was the authentication um, objection made? It was, wasn't it wasn't it made sort of at the end of everything? It, it sort of was, and, and and it was it wasn't really. It was just that photographs can't be a business record, and they shouldn't come in because the gentleman didn't testify. But again, the five steps were met by Mr. Warren, who testified that these were regularly kept in the investigation. And the plaintiff, I mean, the plaintiff doesn't dispute that they're photographs of the house, and there's. 350 or 400 other photographs here that came into evidence. These were 11, and, and I did take a look last night, and, and these photographs are also substantially similar to other pictures of the area at 1396, 1455, 1490, 1491. For, for all of these reasons, there really wasn't the right objection. They're part of the business records. Plus photographs are admissible, even without being a business record. Uh, the silent witness theory, if there's no question under McCorkle that they actually are an accurate depiction, there was no objection that they were an accurate depiction. So we believe that, that again, this was another ruling by the trial court within her discretion. Um, again, we move on then to act back and forth with the mold and the directed verdict because plaintiff never listed an expert witness, but only mentioned that she thought there was mold, there's no coverage for mold, there was no separate claim for testing, and at trial, there was no evidence whatsoever that could have been used to get around a directed verdict. Uh, so the trial court absolutely was correct in granting the directed verdict motion on mold, We've argued and believe that the jury instructions absolutely correctly followed the claims of the parties and the shifting burdens under the policy. Um, and that is well laid out in, my, in our brief and we'll rely on that, but it seems as though there was some concern about the set off. And, and I think that that, again, the real issue here is that they're not happy that the jury didn't give them enough money, even though the jury believed his case, the set off was absolutely proper. The setoff was proper for multiple reasons. And I think what the plaintiff does is 
fails to separate the separate independent issues of proposal for settlements themselves and duplication of damages. Here, these two plaintiffs own this home with an indivisible right to any recovery under the policy as tenants by the entirety. There's one loss, there's one damage, the plaintiff cannot have a windfall, they don't get to have a double recovery. The fact that there's proposal law, whether two to one, one to two is valid or not, that's, that's not relevant here. All that's relevant is that there was a settlement for the one amount of damage to which both Mr. and Mrs. Pilecki are entitled. Um, there were two different proposals for settlement. Darren, you seem to focus a lot on the um, language in the proposal that this would not affect any award or the, you know, the claim of um, Andrea Pilecki. So how would you address that argument that the, the language of the proposal for settlement here um, precluded the set off in this manner? So it, it doesn't, and in fact, it says the opposite. So, and I think um, there's a couple of things. One, it is incorrect that Mr. Pilecki's proposal for settlement included bad faith damages or anything other than the damages that were made in the one counts complaint. And there's a difference in the proposal for settlement between what is being settled and what is the condition of the settlement. So this proposal resolves all damages that would otherwise be awarded to Darren Pilecki in a final judgment in the subject action. Case law has made it very clear that bad faith damages are not appropriate in a first party lawsuit until coverage and damages are established. So the first, the bad faith issue. The bad faith is not included in the damages. Instead, all that's included in the damages to both Darren, and then ultimately both in her proposal, but also in the verdict, anything that could be in the final judgment of the subject action, which is a one count complaint for the, the property loss, the hurricane loss. The conditions are what he's actually um, talking about, which is as a condition, Darren Pilecki will release his bad faith count, which is interesting if that hadn't been included, what they would have tried to do after the settlement with the PFS has come back and sued FedNAT for bad faith. So that had to be included in order to shut down the case as to Darren Pilecki. So it's a condition, it's not a damage that they paid for because it couldn't have been a damage that was recoverable in the complaints at, in this case at the time. Um, let's see. Moving on to whether or not it would affect her claim, it are did you, not. Counsel, are you saying that, it, that, that, that the proposal could not have included damages for bad faith? It did not. And it, I know it, I mean, I mean, I know the language says it did not, but I'm asking, you, you seem to suggest that it, it couldn't possibly, even, well, even if they had written it in there. If they had written it in there, I don't know whether it might have been a valid issue later for serving as a platform or not, but I'll, but here it did not. It absolutely did not because it was not a final. It was, dra it was drafted in a way that did not include uh, damages for bad faith, correct? But correct, it disposed absolutely. of any claim for bad faith. Correct. It was it disposed of it, it was resolving all damages that would otherwise be rewarded in a final judgment in this action, which this Counsel, action, I'm going to give I'm going to give both sides an extra two minutes because I, I think that I forgot to uh, <laughs> tell our appellant when he was into his rebuttal time. So you'll have an extra two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of issues here. What, what uh, do you so, make of the what what did you make of this? The language and I get I think it's C4 the proposal to the husband where it says the acceptance of this proposal and negotiation of the check will not affect the claim of Andrea Pilecki. What, what claim does she have left if you say that you set it all off because the husband agreed? But, but that's the whole issue. She had the right to bring a claim for the $133,000 or more, and she did. It didn't affect her claim in this action. She brought it. It's just that it is a duplicate recovery for one loss. And what's also interesting is that well, counsel, if claim includes damages, if it includes damages, then then certainly the settlement would affect her claim, right? 
uh, under your theory? It doesn't affect her ability to proceed with her claim. But it is it her ability to recover an amount of damages, and it doesn't matter whether the settlement came from her or let's just say it one doesn't of these say folks, it doesn't say it doesn't affect her ability to proceed with her claim. That's not quite what it says. It says it doesn't affect her claim, and I believe that it didn't. And here's here's the interesting thing. Let's just say the dry first people had damaged the home when they were out there, and the dry first people had, had, had messed something up. Any settlement re recovered from anyone under the set-off, collateral source set-off issues in Florida Statute 46015 would be set off against the ultimate award. And again, it was for exactly what went to verdict, the damages for the home. Um, the for which they don't get a duplication. If they were allowed to recover that $30,000 again, they would have a windfall and they are not entitled to but aren't But aren't you the one who's responsible for crafting the language that might've made it ambiguous between the two of them that they have different claims? But it, it, it isn't the, any ambiguity in a PFS, which is a separate issue that actually we're, we're briefing now, isn't the issue here. It's, that's an independent issue. If, if, this, if this is an ambiguous PFS, then may or may not serve for a platform for FedNAT to recover its fees, which it has, uh, and which the plaintiff is challenging by separate appeal, that's separate. All that we're dealing with here is whether or not they get a duplicate recovery when she was claiming the same exact damages. She can't could it, get could it not be viewed as a contract between the parties though? It, it, it is actually because it's a, the, it, the law is, and we've cited in our brief, that a proposal is in the nature of a contract and it must be viewed as. So I think to the, to the other judges' questions, the, the contract between the party, was the contract between the party here ambiguous in the sense of whether a setup would be applied to the claim? Actually, no, because it goes on to say in subsection five, that the amount paid to Darren Pilecki pursuant to the proposal will be set off from any additional sums if awarded to Andrea Pilecki. And if I may take that a step further, two steps further, after the settlement was accepted, FedNet amended its affirmative defenses to assert the set off for the $30,000 settlement. That was never challenged. That was never moved to strike. There wasn't a response. Secondly, Mrs. Pilecki, Andrea Pilecki is on the check so she can't claim that this wasn't a portion of her damages, the same damages she sought at trial, the claims in this case, and there should have been a set off as there was. Again, the problem here is- But that, that, par that paragraph doesn't say that either though. It doesn't say it's your name is on a check because it's a portion of your damages. It says this condition is purely to prevent a dispute as how the check will be made payable. It's a condition of Darren's release that it will her name will be on the check, but in fact she was. So it's disingenuous to claim that she wasn't recovering money for the one loss. Council, thank you very much. You're you're out of time. Thank you. We um, would request that you affirm. Thank you. All right, Council for the appellant. I believe that I, uh, and it's partially my fault because I didn't give you a reminder as I usually try to do, but. You ran out of time, but we've given each side two extra minutes. So you have two minutes in rebuttal and you be, can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to, to point out, I, I, told, I told you I would get this for you. Um, the uh, questioning with the witness uh, is in the record, but then I also, after the judge did not allow me to enter the mold remediation evidence into evidence, I had it marked as identification that entered into the record as exhibit Z. And that's referenced in the answer brief as well. Um, and showed the court what he would have testified to as to those damages. So very quickly, I also objected to the photographs coming in before they were made. And that when I made the objection before they came in, I pointed the court to the um, trial brief that we had filed on that issue before trial, making it clear that they had to call somebody who actually observed the property in order did to- Did you object when they were moved into evidence or did you object when they were being discussed by the witness? Yes, I objected before they, as soon as they were going down that road, I objected. We went sidebar. I pointed the court to my trial brief. I said, judge, they have to have somebody who's actually seen the property. He's never even been there. They can't come in. Counsel, on the proposal issue, how is this, a, how is this, how is there any ambiguity here at all? I mean, the proposal expressly deals with the set off issue. So 
So the most simplest terms, a contract is between two people. Bednat served a proposal for settlement to Darren Pilecki for $30,000. Only Darren Pilecki, pursuant to their own terms, could they decide whether to accept that or not. Andrea Pilecki never accepted that. She was never given any option. The only option she was given was another proposal for settlement for $5,000 which included everything plus fees and plus costs and which, which would result in her recovering absolutely nothing. Federated National chose to serve 30,000 to Darren Pilecki and 5,000 to Mrs. Pilecki. That's the only option she was given. So the only option she was given was to recover nothing. She never consented to this 30,000 for all these other damages to be applied as a set off to her. She never entered that agreement. Their entire argument is based on the need for Andrea Plucky to have agreed to that, which she never did. And she never was even given an option because the only option she had was the 5,000 proposal for settlement, which would result in her and recover nothing. It was clearly improper to apply a set off of $30,000 to a proposal for settlement. Thank you, counsel. To her. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, counsel. Okay, with that, we are uh, adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.